Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's Telephone Town Hall. I'm Molly Gray, candidate for Lieutenant Governor of Vermont, and I'm pleased to be on tonight talking to you about broadband and internet here in Vermont uh, during COVID-19 and beyond. Tonight, we're joined by special guest Chris Reccia, the Managing Director of ValleyNet and EC Fiber. He's also the former Commissioner of the Vermont Department of Public Service. We're also joined by Paul Costello, Executive Director of the Vermont Council on Rural Development, and Representative Laura Sibelia, Vice Chair of the Vermont House Committee on Energy and Technology. So we're here tonight to take your questions. There's no silly question when it comes to broadband and internet, so please press zero on your keypad or on your phone now to be added to the queue. We want to answer your questions for the next hour and be a resource for you. So again, if you're just joining us, my name is Molly Gray. I'm hosting tonight's Telephone Town Hall with our speakers, and we'll be discussing broadband, broadband and internet solutions across Vermont uh, during COVID-19 um, and beyond. Our guests are Chris Reccia of ValleyNet and EC Fiber, and also Paul Costello from the Vermont Council on Rural Development, and Representative Laura Sibelia will be updating us on what's happening in the legislature. So right now we're dialing out to thousands of Vermonters and uh, folks are also calling in. So in just a few minutes, we'll get started. But if you're just joining us, again, this is a town hall on broadband and internet solutions for Vermont. It's certainly a challenging time uh, during COVID-19 to be at home uh, with broadband or without broadband and trying to uh, manage distance learning, remote work, um, access to information. So tonight's telephone town hall is for you, for all of you folks calling in, and we're here to take your questions. And again, I'm joined by Chris Reccia from ValleyNet and EC Fiber, who's also the former commissioner of the De Vermont Department of Public Service uh, by Representative Laura Sibelia, uh, who's calling in from Westover, and we'll talk about uh, some of the work that is happening around the state and in the legislature and Paul Costello. So again, my name is Molly Gray, and I'm your moderator and host tonight. I'm also a candidate for lieutenant governor and work in the attorney general's office. But tonight's event is really about um, internet and broadband. What we know now in the state is about 23% of the state does not have access to the internet. That's about 69,000 businesses and also residential homes. And there have been a lot of efforts uh, over the last few weeks to think about where do we go from here? How do we connect to the disconnected in Vermont? Um, how do we get internet into our homes and think about how we can uh, treat internet in the same way that we treat heat, electricity, um, or some of our other utilities in serving every single Vermonter here in the state. So I'm so pleased to be joined by three different speakers, all with different backgrounds, um, who are prepared to take your questions and also talk a little bit about what's happening at the local level in our communities, um, at the state level, and also uh, from the perspective of a, of a uh, company providing EC, EC Fiber, which is providing broadband and internet here in Vermont. So again, we're ready to take your questions. Please press zero on your phone to, to be added to the queue. And I'm going to begin by uh, introducing our speakers, again, Paul Costello, um, Laura, and Chris. And Paul, why don't you go first? Tell us a little bit about yourself um, and what brings you to the town hall tonight. Well, the Council on Rural Development has been devoted to universal broadband service for more than 20 years now. Um, we are uh, dedicated to the progress of rural communities as they define it. We uh, have a deep history of going to communities and helping folks add up directions and connect to state and federal resources. And broadband has been a rural priority uh, for more than a generation now. We've made a lot of progress, but that 23% is uh, still a strikingly important uh, figure, uh, especially in a time of a of pandemic like this where telemedicine, homeschooling, meetings online make broadband major health and welfare issue, an educational justice and opportunity issue, and a citizenship sovereignty issue that's fundamental to modern democracy. And what does it mean today that lower income children at the end of the dirt road who are out of school are fundamentally provided different educational opportunities to connect to teachers and follow curricula? 
Uh, what does it mean to rural communities when young people and tourists will not live or visit without broadband access? Um, what does it mean when we think about the future of the economy in a place where you can't participate in the global economic uh, op opportunity set that's out there? Where in Vermont, we're, we're all about local. We want to spur our local economy, but in doing so, we want to we want to seize global opportunities. And I just kind of bring it to a point with a the story of Al's snowmobile back way back in the 2000s, early 2000s. They basically had a barn load of parts, and they were cataloged, but they weren't. Um, but but they decided to put them online, and they barcoded them, and they. They put them in front of the world, and suddenly they go from being a small Northeast Kingdom business to a global business that's selling parts to Siberia. And you think about all the different businesses and people who live in the hills of rural Vermont and the opportunity for people to participate working in San Francisco or Mumbai from a, a hilltop homestead. Uh, it's just a fundamental economic opportunity for the future of the state. So. We're dedicated to it, and we're glad to glad that this conversation is going on tonight. Well, thank you so much for joining us and for raising a lot of um, questions and issues that I hope we can get to on the call uh, tonight, um, and especially talking about rural Vermont. I grew up in Newberry, where you know, one in three children don't have access to the internet right now. Yet there's a lot of incredible open homes that I think folks would move to if we had um, broadband. So our next speaker is Representative Laura Sibelia. Uh, Laura's calling in from West Dover, Vermont, and she's from the Vice Chair of the House Committee on Energy and Technology. And uh, folks who know Laura know that she's been a real champion pushing for equal access to broadband here in Vermont. Laura, thank you so much for joining us. Um, the floor is yours. Thanks, Molly. Uh, I'm really happy to be here. This is one of my favorite topics to talk about. Um, as you noted, I live in rural Vermont, and I have for the past 30 years. Um, I've been serving the legislature since 2015 and representing six towns on the mass border and along the southernmost part of Route 100 North. And, you know, they are, by and large, very disconnected. Um, I've been interested in the issue of connecting Vermont for really the last decade and working on it um, through my economic development work outside of the legislature and now, as you said, um, in the House Energy and Technology Committee. So we've been working for a number of years, uh, trying and failing to get providers to build out in rural Vermont. And, you know, at the end of the day, the, the state really cannot make providers uh, build out. We are federally preempted. Uh, broadband has been, has been regulated as a, um, as a, by the, by the market. It hasn't been regulated as uh, like a utility, like um, like a critical piece of infrastructure that's needed for everyday modern life. And so that has left um, the rural, really expensive parts of Vermont um, without modern telecommunications infrastructure. So as I said, after trying and failing to get providers to build out, um, not having, um, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars for the state to build out, Last year, we passed major legislation uh, in Act 79 that essentially said, uh, no one's coming to save you. Um, here are some tools, communities. Um, it is up to you, uh, really incentivizing and supporting and pointing to um, the CUD model. Um, I'm so happy that we have Chris Recchia on. He'll talk about you know, our number one uh, CUD best practices uh, here in Vermont, EC Fiber. Um, and that effort last year provided planning dollars and human resources support for volunteers on the ground, as well as some veto lending. Uh, I like to think about the CUDs as the democratization of our telecommunications system in Vermont, like the electric Laura, cooperatives. Yeah. Laura, could you um, – my brother the other day says, Molly, you're having a town hall on broadband – people don't fully understand what CUDs are and how this happens. Ah. So what is, what is a CUD, if you don't mind breaking that down for us? Sure, sure. So a CUD is a communications union district. Um, and a CUD is formed when you have two towns that uh, go to a town meeting 
and their voters say, yes, we would like to join, um, and it's, uh, uh, it's basically a means of financing utility build-outs. Um, other towns are able to join by vote of their select board. Uh, CUD is governed by a board of directors. Uh, all of the towns have, um, have a, an individual representative, um, and then they do the planning work, um, contract with uh, builders and operators, and build out network. Um, I don't want to go too deep into it because, as I said, we do have an, a CUD expert on the phone um, in Chris Recchia. But thank you for letting me kind of high high <laughs> level. Because um, there are a lot of towns actually across the state um, that have either either recently joined a CUD or are contemplating joining a CUD right now, which is pretty darn exciting. So I think thank I'll stop you. there, Molly, if that's okay. Yeah, that's perfect. I just wanted to make sure that we, uh, as we use some language, that folks on the phone um, have some frame of reference. And this is a great segue to Chris, who is the managing director of ValleyNet, uh, a fiber um, to the home design, building, and operating internet company located in Royalton, Vermont. Uh, ValleyNet is the operating company for EC Fiber, which is now a 27-town communications union district, a CUD in central Vermont. And Chris used to be the commissioner of the Department of Public Service, so we can also talk about what's happening, I think, in the, at the administrative level here in Vermont with um, perhaps the new emergency broadband action plan. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm hoping you can mm -hmm. talk about that, Chris. And also, he was the deputy yep. secretary of the Agency of Natural Resources uh, previously and lives in Randolph on a farm. Chris, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Molly, and uh, hi, Laura, hi, Paul, and um, hi, everybody else out there. Um, thank you for the opportunity, and this is really an exciting time, as painful as uh, this has all been. It really has highlighted how important um, Internet is to people, both, you know, students as well as businesses, as well as people just working from home. Um, and it's really, uh, it really is, as Molly said, this is an essential utility, and we've been trying for years to get it to be thought of like electricity uh, when we made the commitment to make sure electricity got to everyone's home. We need to do the same with Internet. Um, and I'm pleased to be uh, representing um, ValleyNet, which is a company that designs, builds, and operates fiber to the home, the fastest available uh, speeds and uh we call it uh, city internet in rural living, and um, and we are contracted as ValleyNet. We work um, behind the scenes, really, with the with the CUDs, the Communication Union Districts. The first of which was EC Fiber, and kind of the uh, the main one that's gotten underway. And I'll explain a little bit about that because EC Fiber got started um, when there was no uh, Act 79. We got started with some private investors that wanted internet to their houses, <laughs> and, uh, and they could afford it, and so um, started building the system that way, and along the way hooked up other people along the way, and then eventually got some private uh, funding, um, investing funding, which uh, helped do the next batch, and that got to the point where we were able to consider um, adding towns. Uh, just really informally, it was a 24-member town at, uh, group at the time that said, yeah, if this doesn't cost us anything, yeah, we're interested. And it, and so we engaged with them um, and, uh, and basically started building the, the network to the point where it started looking like, wow, this model actually works. And so um, we – we were then able to form a CUD under um, Act 79 and, and a little before to um, make use of and available to us um, uh, revenue bonds, the revenue bounding power of municipalities um, in order to finance the construction of the system. And I distinguish that, it's a really important concept, is to distinguish that from taxing power. We do not use any taxing um, authorities of towns, actually, nor do nor are towns allowed to. It's very clear in the law that they are not allowed to do that. So all of the, um, all of the expenses of the system are paid for by the users of the system through just, you know, <clears throat> monthly fees. 
And um, and in that process, we've been able to uh, go out to the municipal bond market, get very favorable rates, increasingly favorable as we've shown more and more success. Um, we have used about $40 million um, to build in the 22 main towns that we've built in so far. Uh, we have 4,500 customers um, for internet. We have about uh, about 3,000 of those are also phone customers, and we can talk about the di distinction of those things. But um, we are just delighted with the ability to go. We start in the most rural parts of communities and work our way inward so that we're making sure we're getting to every house. And we do that, and we're able to provide speeds up to 800 megabits per second, um, which is the fastest that's really available. So. I'm really pleased with what we've been doing, and I think to kind of um, build on what Paul was asking, we do this as a nonprofit, and ValleyNet is also a nonprofit. We do it because we truly believe that for equitable access to the economy, we need to provide this to everyone, and we think it's in Vermont's future. Um, if Vermont is to have a future, we really do think that this is really a critical infrastructure to have. So um, I think probably I will stop there too, Molly, and uh, look forward to people's questions and the discussion. Thank you so much. And um, I look forward to talking more about all that you're doing, especially during COVID-19. So we have a lot of folks calling in, um, hundreds on the line here. Thank you so much for joining us. If you do have a question, and again, there's no silly question. We've got um, technology experts, legislative experts, rural development experts. Please press zero on your phone to get in the queue. We want to get as many questions in this evening as possible. So we're going to take our first question from um, Marcus in Essex. Marcus, you're on the line. Thanks, Molly. I appreciate it. Thank you for putting this together. Um, and uh, Molly, uh, so many questions, but the one I'll focus on is technology. Um, I live in Essex currently, but um, you know, so I'm I'm grateful for the fact that I I happen to have great service. Um, but it, it, just a handful of years ago, I was in Westford, so still a part of Chittenden County, but yet I had no internet service. Um, so I know what it's like, and but to get to those communities that are probably the hardest to get to, one of the things I'm thinking about is technology. We, you know, I'd love to have Valley Net in every one of these communities, but I'm also curious about looking at mobile technologies. Have you happen? Do you know of any conversations happening about mobile technologies? We need more mobile towers in order to increase our cellular. Uh, abilities. With that, we could potentially utilize that to increase our bandwidth for internet. So I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on that and what our experts' thoughts are on other technologies as well, not just cabling or fiber. Terrific. And yeah. Marcus, thank you so much for joining us. I didn't um, recognize who it was until I heard your voice. It's Marcus from Curtin Marcus in the Morning Drive. Um, thanks so much for calling in. So. Um, Speakers, it's up to you who wants to go first. Uh, I don't know if that was Paul that jumped in. Paul, do you want to start? No, it was, no, it was Chris. And I, 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 I <laughs> Chris, go for it. Yeah, no, that's, that's a great question. Um, and as you know, cell cell phone uh, availability in Vermont is also struggling. And the and the reason is because we live in such a beautiful place. Um, if we lived in Kansas, this would be a lot easier. But we have these things that we call mountains, and we have valleys, and we have people tucked into hillsides. And the way the mobile technology works is it needs to be pretty much line of sight um, in order to get the uh, in order to get the service. And so that's a challenge. But I think there is a role, um, and uh, you know we we are improving mobile service. One thing about the um, the fiber to the home, I mentioned phone service before, and you can actually hook your cell phone into your into a, into your um, internet um, to go the other way when you don't have cell service at home. But to answer the question is there are, there's a CUD in the Northeast Kingdom that is using a combination of fiber and, uh, and fixed wireless technology to try and get to every home. 
Um, it has some advantages and, uh, and some disadvantages, but from a technology point, we felt that the fiber right to the home was really the best option. Um, but I think you're right. We're going to be faced with with cellular problems until you know there are enough towers to get everywhere, and that I'm not sure people are really receptive to seeing that many towers around. Let others join in here. Laura, is there anything you'd like to add, or Paul? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, you know, I think the notion of um, Fiber is really, um, it, it really is much more future proof. Um, we've seen some wholesale fixed wireless projects, um, uh, you know, attempted to be built out in Vermont. And as Chris noted, you know, that line of sight is so critically important. Um, so it's very difficult to get a wholesale um, wireless, uh, fixed wireless project built out because of our hills. Um, the notion of fiber with um, fixed wireless for, you know, for patches, you know, that kind of combination, I think there's, you know, a lot of promise in that. Um, you know, I think Marcus was actually also talking about cellular. And so with cellular, um, the, most promising, um, the most promising thing that I'm aware of with regards to cellular service is um, the potential expansion through uh, FirstNet. Uh, FirstNet is a national program, uh, first responders national uh, program. AT&T was awarded um, uh, hundreds of millions of dollars nationally and um, a tremendous amount of bandwidth to build a, um, a cellular network that could be um, <clears throat> could be routed just for emergency traffic, and that came about after um, after 9/11. So. That, that bandwidth, those towers, that infrastructure, um, you know, it, we presume that AT&T will leverage that commercially uh, in addition. Um, and that, that first net project is in the process of being built out now, the, a number of years before it's completed. That's hopeful. First net seems like a, a good direction to be headed in. Paul, do you have anything to add? No, I think we've covered it pretty well. Okay. Marcus, thanks so much for your question. Okay, we've got a number of other questions here. Um, the next question I take is from Dick, who's calling in from Corinth. Dick, you're on the line. Hi, thanks. Um, yeah, I'm wondering, um, with all this, uh, with, uh, there's some state money uh, uh, involved and possibly um, a big chunk of federal money involved. Uh, what's the best way to ensure that uh, competing technologies are fairly treated in this. I'm thinking about that there's a lot of, um, there's some vested interests uh, in technologies that are already established in, in parts of Vermont, and they're going to they're gonna want to try to get some of this money too. But um, from what I've read, there, there's, a, there's a really good uh, book about these technologies called Fiber by Susan Crawford, and she lays out a very compelling argument that that a fiber-based network is the best way to go. So my question is, how how can we ensure that the money is 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 put to best use uh, in in building a statewide fiber network? Thank you, Dick. Uh, Laura, do you want to start with this one? Sure, sure, absolutely. Well, one of the ways that um, you can ensure that uh, the department does have the Department of Public Service has put out an emergency broadband plan um, in response to COVID and with the, the possibility of federal funds coming in that looks to how, um, how we might solve this problem in the next four years. Um, and so you could, and they're seeking public comment. Uh, and that's up on, if you, can, if you are able to get to the Department of Public Services website, you can view that there. Um, and that is, um, that is one way that you could um, ensure um, ensure that we're looking at the correct type of technology, whatever you think that might be. Um, I tend to, um, I think, agree with Dick. I think I heard him say, um, you know, fiber is the way to go. Uh, fiber has the benefit of uh, symmetrical speeds up and down, upload speeds and download speeds. I mean, it's really only limited by the equipment that you put on the ends of it, uh, on either end of, of that fiber network. Um, right now, we are, we are largely um, 
uh, provided with uh, old copper network, um, including you know DSL, which is providing uh, um, uh, internet for uh, much of rural Vermont uh, with slow speeds. You know we're looking at 10.1 or uh, that's what we have here at my house. We might we might have seven one or five one, um, and then a lot of uh, a lot of cable, which provides a twenty five three speed, and twenty five three speeds are what the federal government currently considers uh, served. It's the current broadband definition. Uh, fiber, which we've been talking about, is we, we look at like a hundred a hundred speeds. So, Dick, I'd, I'd respond just to say um, that, you know, you're really asking a, a political question um, around vested interests. One of the interesting things about broadband is how, um, you know, when you, when you look at polls on rural development or on the needs of the state in the future, broadband is almost always the top thing. Everyone talks about it, and it's been a huge priority. Both It was a priority for, for Governor Douglas, a priority for Governor Shumlin. And I think there's been good faith efforts uh, to to get to ubiquitous high speed, and fiber has been um, the future-proof sort of gold seal. But when you think about organizing at the state level, there's you know there's a lot of advocacy for the environment. There's a lot of advocacy organized in other areas, but there isn't a lot of public advocacy organized for broadband in the way that many other issues are, and. It, it feels to me that this is such a high priority that um, people should be um, rallying together. So I, I certainly would encourage you to talk to your legislators and and uh, ask them to make it a priority, and especially to fiber as they're looking at the federal resources available and the COVID response work that the state's going to do. That That in a crisis like this, it's the time to raise our sights for not the economy with all the challenges that we've we've seen before the COVID crisis, but but a, a, a revitalized economy for rural Vermont into the future. Yeah, and thanks, Paul. And this is Chris. The only the only other addition I want to say is, um, Dick, I think you lucked out here because just on Tuesday, the EC Fiber Board um, voted to allow four new towns into the into the, its district and that includes Corinth. The other three were Fairley, West Fairley and Windsor. So um I think we've committed to uh to bring in new fiber and so that's that's a good thing and I think we'll be able to do it relatively quickly because we've got the system already established in the other towns. Thanks so much Dick for your call and, and thanks uh speakers for the the thoughts and response. I'll also add on the um, emergency broadband action plan that the comment period, as Laura mentioned, is open. It's open till May 26th, and the email address is psd.telecom, T-E-L-E-C-O-M, at vermont.gov. And I know that this is an initial draft of a potential action plan, um, that it's really meant to be a framework for any federal money or stimulus money that you know, comes to the state so that Vermont is a ready candidate for stimulus money um, to meet the broadband needs here in Vermont. So speaking of polls, we are going to do a quick poll before taking more questions, but if you're still with us, and there are hundreds of people still with us, thank you for sticking with us. And I think this is a good testament to the fact that we do need advocacy and conversation about around broadband. A number of people tuning in tonight really make it clear that there, this is an issue that's of, of importance. So thank you. So we want to hear from you, and we want to hear um, what the challenges are that you you are facing and how you're using Internet at home. Um, press 1 if you need access to the Internet for working remotely. Press 2 if you need access to the Internet tools for distance learning. Press 3 if you need access to the Internet to run a business uh, that you own. And press four if you need to access the internet for telemedicine or other direct support. And press five if um, more than one of these needs describes you and your family. And we're gonna take another question. We've got a number here. Um, let's hear from Rachel in Rochester. Rachel, Hi. you're on the line. 
thank you. Molly, thanks a lot for juggling COVID right now and being so multifaceted in how you're interacting with us. I really appreciate it, um, including on the landline here today. I'm calling from the side of a mountain, no cell service, and um, and I'm in a homeowners association that refuses to help out our local community um, with its first responder needs. Um, and it's a very interesting relationship between some of the second homeowners and some of us who are living here full time who really refuse to give up their own individual um, concerns about 5G and about uh, technology and not helping the first responders in town, particularly um, in a time like this. So um, I'm delighted to hear about the first net initiative. It's wonderful. And it would be great, Molly, if you could put the, the email that you mentioned on your website or in your Twitter feed so, so I could share that with some of the guys on the fire department. Um, so here's Absolutely. my question. My question is, um, yes, there are vest, vested interests and political and a lot of money involved in this. And, and my question for you, Molly, as Lieutenant Governor, would you push for um, Internet services, essentially ISP services, to become a public utility as opposed to the private initiatives and the CUDs that sound semi-public-private. Philosophically, do you see the Internet as like a state road, a, an essential um, a tool for the development of the economy of Vermont? Sure. Thank you so much for your question. And you know, tonight's call is really about providing information, so I want to really focus on the speakers that we have and the resources they're um, able to offer as, as the experts. But I think philosophically, the challenge that we've had in Vermont is that we've thought about Internet as something that's nice to have, not as something that's absolutely necessary to have as you're trying to access medicine, trying to um, uh, uh, communicate with a first responder if necessary, trying to teach your kids at home, um, trying to access economic opportunity. And Paul's talked about um, working rurally and having access to the world. And, and you can't do that in, in you know, 34% of, 23% of our state right now. So I think if we fr shift our thinking to thinking about the internet in the same way that we think about water, or electricity, or heat, or the basic needs that we have in our homes every single day, that can also frame our understanding of the necessity. But in terms of um, whether it's a public partnership or a private partnership or a mix of both, um, you know, I think that there's a lot of opportunity. The bigger question for me is how do we do it? And I think we've seen a lot of um, our communications union districts figure out how to do it. And that is the greatest priority. How do we get internet access to Vermonters? So with that, I want to turn it over to the experts. Um, you know, Chris, why don't we talk to you a little bit more about how you provide that service and how do you think about, you know, either as the former commissioner of the Department of Public Service or in your current job, how do you think about internet as a utility? Um, yeah. And what does that mean? Yeah. Yes, I think that's really, that is the key. And um, I do think of it as a utility, even though it isn't regulated as one now. I do still think, um, you know, for those that want to get in the weeds, um, the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, is actually the one who determines um, Internet for the United States, and the states are precluded from regulating that. Um, that said, you know, this is a we are a nonprofit at ValleyNet, um, but it's a it is a public private partnership in the sense that uh, in the sense that um, well it's like everything else even with regulated utilities they are pr usually privately owned utilities or co-ops um, they can be co-ops but they're but they then have to follow rules that are beneficial and in in the public interest and that's really how I think of it. Um, that that internet is in the public interest, and we ought to be doing what we can to get get to people. And an example, I guess, would be with the COVID thing. Um, we realized pretty quickly 
even though you know we have a lot of members um, and a lot of customers, there are a lot of people that just can't afford this. And they, they then we're immediately forced into home school learning, home work, um, with maybe no ability to 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 do that. And what we did was say, okay, so one of our missions is to make sure that people have access to this and they have it when they need it. And we immediately went into offering free installations and free service through the rest of the school year, even without knowing when that was going to be, if it was going to be, for anyone who is uh, any family of students that were eligible for free school lunch or on um, SNAP or any, anything like that. And so we've hooked up about um, about 40 of uh, new families that um, that needed that that were in our territory that we could immediately hook up. And so we've done that, and we'll continue to do that. And we might we might be extending it because this doesn't look like it's getting over soon. We hope to be able to provide a a lower price for um, for those families going forward. But in the meantime, it's free, and we just want to make sure people had access for those tools uh, at this really, you know, critical time. Um, I don't think, yeah, we can talk more about uh, about um, uh, ValleyNet and, and the decisions we've made uh, in terms of trying to provide internet. But I think the idea of it being a private versus public. Um, is not really the key question. I think the key question is what do the communities need? Um, and the CUD provides a really good structure to get community input and still make sure we're efficiently kind of reaching those homes that I, don't I have, have service. I have a reflection on this, Molly. Uh, please, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, to me, uh, broadband has become mm -hmm. an essential utility for the future. It's just, not, it's just, yeah. it's just, plain essential. Um, the bottom line is that pure market economics have not worked to drive uh, broadband to the last mile. That if exactly. people were making money doing it, they would be doing it. And the, the, the market itself hasn't produced enough uh, money at the end of the pipe to pay for the pipe. So inevitably there's a public private partnership and the CUDs are one version of that but we've also put money federal money into utilities uh, into uh, internet providers and fiber uh, throughout the state of Vermont over the years we, we can't uh, pretend that it's just uh, private capitalism that's doing this work um, so uh, it, you know it's it's interesting to reflect back to where EC fiber comes from um, and, and I'm not saying this because we caused it, but we worked for a few years with citizen groups throughout the, the state of Vermont. There were over 50 broadband committees at one point that were aggregating local demand. They were trying to connect with small wireless providers back in the, in the early 2000s. And committees of those folks on their own said, you know, we really need to think about regional systems. And I was in the town hall in Tunbridge the evening that well, some 14, 15 of them, Chris, got together and said, we yep. need to be a unionized district to make this work at scale. And that's the only way we're going to be able to bring the dollars together. And we have to work cooperatively to make the finances work over the long period of time. And so we've come a long way. We've got the seeds to at least one part of the solution in that, that, um, again, is really been built up from the willpower and energy and smarts of, of local Vermonters throughout the state. Yeah, Paul, you're exactly right, and I want to agree with that because I think the key thing that you mentioned was that you, it's just not economical to go to the last mile for a purely private enterprise to do, and that's why that's really why we were formed, to start at the, at the last mile and work our way in. and. Um, and we also realized, and you, you mentioned another point that I, I want to emphasize, is towns have tried this on their own before um, and have not been able to do it just one town at a time. The system doesn't work that way. It would be like building an interstate one section at a time and hoping that you line up with the next town, um, you know, that the interstate still lines up when, when the next town decides to do it. Um, and so we really found that to make this economical and make it work, you needed a consortium of, of 
an area that had a big enough population um, and a big enough commitment to make to make it work. Great. Thank you so much for your question, Rachel. And I think it's been such a fruitful discussion about what is um, what is broadband and how do we talk about it, and then also the the power of the private partner private um, public partnerships here in the state and what's happening at the real local level. Um, starting in the Tunbridge Town Hall to make things happen here in Vermont. So I think there's a lot of lessons learned and information to be shared, and this is such an uh, important moment to, to uh, take stock of what we know and figure out where we can go. So I did want to reflect on the poll. We have some data, which I love, um, from everyone who's called in. 66% of folks calling in tonight have um, more than one need that describes their family. So. Um, needing to access the internet for telemedicine or to run a business or for distance learning or for um, working remotely. And 31%, um, almost the other third entirely, uh, of folks calling in need the internet to work remotely. So that's some information for us as we take our next um, call, which we're going to take one from Aditi in Winooski. Aditi, you are on the line. Awesome. Hi, Molly. Thanks so much for putting this together. Um, obviously, like you said, I'm based in Winooski, but I have a lot of friends who would love to live outside of Pittman County but are nervous about those professional opportunities and the lack of broadband as we're speaking of. Um, if we're able to invest in better infrastructure, do you think this would increase professional opportunities and allow you know, people, younger Vermonters to settle down in the more rural parts of the state? And do you think, more importantly, that Vermont businesses are open to this and are kind of pushing for it as well? Thank you so much for your question. And um, I certainly have some views as a <clears throat> Vermonter that want, would love to be able to work remotely from um, Newberry, from the farm where I grew up, but knowing that that's uh, very challenging right now because of the lack of internet access. I mean, I'll just quickly say that I think as we talk about Vermont's demographic challenges, we often leave broadband out of the conversation, and we don't think of it as one of the biggest potential economic drivers for our state, not only in, in um, encouraging people moving to the state to move to our rural communities, but also being able to work from home or run a business from home. So I think it's kind of a no-brainer from my perspective, but um, maybe, Paul, we'll start with you, and then, Laura, if you have anything to add, and, and then Chris. Well, I think that uh, that it's interesting. We, we often work with communities that want to scope out what are the actual businesses in our town. You think of a place like Newbury, and you – you see a couple of businesses on Main Street and you don't recognize the fact that there's so much going on in people's homes, that there are people who are stockbrokers, they're gamers, they're designers, they're coders, they're doing parts of a process with a team. I have a friend who has a, a room that he pushes different projections and he's working with teams of people in China and, and in other parts of Asia at any hour of the day. And, and so this this kind of uh, interconnection is just crucial to the way business works and to the creative process, actually, in an Internet age. Um, you, you know, that opportunity for us to attract businesses like that, allow young Vermonters to grow and create their own businesses that can connect to global opportunities, is fundamental. One of the interesting things, if you live in, in Newport or uh, Newbury right now and you don't have Internet, you might go down to the space on Maine and Bradford, and you might you connect to the co-working space that's down there. Co-working spaces have popped up all over Vermont, and they're an incredible model to bring people together. But it's partly because of that gap at, at the at the end of the road. Um, but really fundamental to that the thing that you're pointing out, Aditi, uh, is the fact that digital natives, people who are part of an internet culture really have a hard time moving to a place where they're disconnected from it. And that's that's kind of fundamental to the future opportunities of towns that have become peripheralized by the lack of this infrastructure. Yeah, this is, Ed, you know, I would, I would add on to that, 
when we think about, um, you know, the strong desire that we have heard, uh, you know, as a mom um, of, you know, three, three adults, um, three young adults, uh, a strong desire I have um, is for, you know, our kids or, or the next generation to, um, to be able to uh, reside in Vermont. But, you know, what the reality is right now is we have, uh, we have a connected global economy and, you know, our kids can work virtually anywhere. Um, that does not include rural Vermont if they are not connected to, uh, to the Internet. That is, of course, what fuels um, global economy and global connections. So, you know, I think as we are able to get this done, and we are going to get this done, um, we, will, we will see um, more growth in our rural, uh, our rural towns. And I think, uh, I dare say, we'll see um, an increase in uh, different types of businesses, you know, as we have uh, this new modernized infrastructure uh, built out uh, throughout Vermont, uh, which has, you know, a tremendous diversity of recreation opportunities, cultural opportunities throughout the entire state. Yeah, I think I would just add that, you know, from, a, from the COVID-19 standpoint, it has forced us to do something very, very quickly that we um, maybe were tending toward but somewhat afraid of, which is, you know, the working from home and the businesses from home and using really Vermont's assets. Um, we have a beautiful, beautiful state to live in. And if you could work in it too, wouldn't that be ideal? And, you know, that's where um, I think Paul mentioned at the beginning the reciprocal speeds of fiber really come into play because it's one thing if you want to sit in your living room and download a Netflix and watch a movie without the spinning circle of death. You can do that with an asymmetrical system. But if you're an architect, the need to upload plans or an engineer or doing a lot on spreadsheets or uh, designing games, um, gaming systems or things like that, you need the ability to upload that material too and it can't it can't fall off or you can't get 90% of the way and have the thing drop off. So that's where the symmetrical speed of the fiber comes in and why we think that's so important for our future too. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Laura and, and Paul. And thank you, Aditi, for your question. The only other thing I would add is we've talked to so many teachers recently and they are trying so hard to connect with students. And there's some students that have internet. There's some students that don't. In Newbury, I know that there's teachers um, having to drive to homes and hand out printed packets of materials. And as this continues, COVID-19 continues, and as our teachers are rapidly trying to adapt to a, a world where there's um, spotty internet for their students or no internet, I think we will see increased inequity in access to education. And to the extent, you know, that I think Laura said the time is now when we will do it. And I think that there's, there's an urgency um, that's also related to um, economic opportunity and access to, to education. So I wanna do one more poll um, before we ask a few final questions of our speakers. Thank you again for joining us and to the hundreds of callers who have joined us tonight. Uh, the, the question tonight um, is about your experience, and please press one if affordability is a barrier for getting you internet access, or for you getting internet access. Press two if you do not have internet service available at your home or business. Press three if you have internet service that does not meet your needs, and press four if you do have internet and it does meet your needs. And while uh, folks are responding to the poll, we will take one more question. Um, there's a question here from Heather, Heather Elson calling in from uh, Putney. Heather Elson, you are on the line. Hi, Marley. Thank you. Um, my question is, some businesses like co-working spaces have opened up their Wi-Fi for people to use for free. Is there any support for those businesses to continue to provide that free service to the community? Heather, thank you so much for your question. Um, 
Chris, do you want to start with this one? Yeah, sure. We have um, we we have a process uh, for open access Wi-Fi at some of the um, businesses in the EC Fiber territory, and the way we do it is we um, if they sign up and are willing to be a internet cafe, so to speak, we will give them um, the highest speed available at the lowest price and as if they're willing to make that available. And so there is the incentive. And we had we had uh, about a dozen um, uh, businesses, uh, unfortunately, mostly coffee shops and restaurants and things where people could sit and enjoy the internet, which of course they can't do right now because those are closed. But we also um, provide incentives for libraries and, and schools, too, to do the same thing. But um, I think the, the point is that uh, there, there are ways to easily make it attractive for those businesses to open up their Wi-Fi and have it be available. And we provide some security so that they are not, their business is not threatened by having the open access. Usually, we provide two different um, lines for them. Uh, at BCRD, we've worked a lot in Wi-Fi. At, at one point, we got a couple of different federal grants to uh, develop Wi-Fi zones for downtowns, and we built 40 of them with the commitment that they be free and be hosted. But the hosts um, aren't producing the kind of uh, equal up and down speeds that that uh, you can get from EC Fiber or from another fiber network. They they're, they have limits built into them. They're more for tourists. They're for people who open their laptop in the cafe, not necessarily for people who are engineers. Um, today, the Department of Public Service is um, working with Microsoft, which has made an offering to Vermont to, um, to give equipment to communities to do this work. And, um, so if people are, are working at the local level and are interested in Wi-Fi, they should be contacting the department. That's great. And I think, uh, Paul, earlier you were mentioning the co-working spaces here in Vermont, and I know there's one in Bradford, but I think there's over 30 around the state. So I know that there's been a lot of efforts to try to open up um, access to Wi-Fi and to provide it for folks in the community, especially parents who are trying to ensure their kids have access to distance learning. So we're going to do one more poll and take one more question. I'm going to ask the speakers to um, include their closing remarks in the response to the question. But before we go to our last question, which will be from Carrie, uh, for those folks on the line, please press 1 if you'd like to participate in uh, more telephone town halls. Press 2 if you'd like to attend a virtual gathering online using video. Press three if you'd like to volunteer to support future community events like this. We hope to do more telephone town halls. And press four if you'd like to receive news and information primarily online or by email. So the last question tonight is from Carrie in Rochester. Carrie, thank you so much for joining us. Hi, Molly. Thank you for um, for having me. Um, I am glad I. Uh, just snuck in at the end. Um, I just have a question. I'm, I'm sure it's a little bit of a personal question, but I'm sure I am not alone. Um, I know that broadband's efforts have been to get um, to get broadband to every house in the state. Um, we have broadband about a half a mile from my home, where I do have internet, um, but I power my home with solar and wind. Um, and we ran a, a phone line in a culvert all the way down the road, um, you know, 18 years ago. Um, we paid for it. It was done completely through engineering, uh, through, I think it was Fairpoint at the time. And once that, pro and they ran the line and everything was great. And, um, and then um, that became the property, my understanding is it became the property of Fairpoint. And um, now we would like to have, um, and our solar and wind is wonderful, um, and we do have um, kind of spotty uh, internet service, but decent. Um, but we would like to get broadband. And so my question is, and on behalf of other people that I'm have, you know, are living off grid with, you know, with a fair amount of connection. 
Um, is there a process, um, like in our case, the town um, broke through our culvert twice and repaired it, but we're not sure how well. And um, we were told by broadband that we needed to ensure that the culvert was in good repair or repair it before we could take the broadband line down. Um, it's going to cost about $3,000 um, for the line to be done, not including the culvert work. So my two-part two question is, if this is something that is owned by Fairpoint and kind of maintained theoretically by them or the town, um, is there a process through which I can get this um, to work um, without, you know, not on my dime so very much? And secondly, are there interest-free loans um, that uh, people in a situation such as ours could um, have to offset the cost? Thank you. Thank you, Carrie. Molly? If we don't, yeah, I was going to say if we don't get to um, fully answer your question, I just want to share with everyone on the call and with Carrie that our email address is info at mollyforvermont.com. Um, please feel free to reach out with further questions, and thank you all so much for joining us. Speakers, you each have about a minute and 30 seconds to respond to Carrie's question and also provide any concluding um, thoughts or information you'd like to share with everyone calling in tonight. And thank you all for calling in. We had hundreds of folks, hundreds of folks on the line, and I think um, now is certainly a time to focus on broadband and to come together and work together. So thank you for joining us. Laura, the floor is yours. Okay, so just quickly to touch on uh, the last caller's comments, um, you know, as we modernize our power infrastructure, our, um, our electric infrastructure, which we have to do um, looking at uh, climate change, uh, modernizing that system as well, that is really going to rely um, on good Internet connections throughout to, to the last mile. You know, that's another reason why we need to get this done. Um, with regard to... Um, you know, uh, the caller's uh, issues that she's having, I'd encourage her to contact the Department of Public Service directly um, and work with them. Uh, and I would tell folks that are interested in this issue, um, you can watch what is happening in the House Energy and Technology Committee. Um, we will be taking up a bill during this COVID emergency session um, and uh, monitor what is happening with the Department of Public Service. Uh, we're working pretty closely with them. And thanks, Molly. This is a really important topic. I appreciate you including me. Thank you so much for joining us. Paul, over to you. Thank you, Molly. Uh, first thing I would want to do is praise Laura Sabilia for her indefatigable advocacy in the State House. She has been so on point with this issue. She's uh, inspiring, I have to say. And then I'd thank Chris. Um, EC Fiber is a territory, but it's bigger than that. And they have opened themselves up to offer um, in a really incredible and generous way, support to other CUDs, support to other people who are working in this arena, and they're kind of a base place to jump from in, in terms of the expansion of these services. So thanks for all your leadership, Chris. I think we, we're at a point where we're in a crucible with, with the COVID response, and we, uh, we need to dedicate ourselves again to universal high-speed affordable broadband for, for all Vermonters it's, it's a justice issue, and it's an economic issue. And uh, I, I think it's time we pull together and, and as much as possible advocate in one voice to build a solution um, and use the resources that can be available in this crisis to, to, to end the gap. So that's my point. Amen. Amen. Chris, um, the floor Great. is yours. Thank you, Molly. Thank you again for hosting this. Um, Thank you all for participating, uh, and Paul, thank you for those nice words. Um, look, for the Rochester resident, um, we are, uh, Rochester is one of our towns, and yes, off-grid site is, are difficult because, um, because we generally follow the power lines, and if there are no power lines, then it does mean underground, and it can get very expensive if it goes uh, quite a distance. And you're right, we can't use that same culvert because it is owned by Fairpoint successor CCI. But um, go ahead and email us at support at ecfiber.net, 
and we will um, do our best to work out a solution with you. Um, I do want to say from a broader perspective that um, that this is, as we've said, an essential service, and it, it's it's critical to the future of Vermont. And the COVID situation has thrown us all into a new world that um, we're going to learn some good lessons from. And I want to keep the good, even when we get back to whatever normal looks like, I want to keep the good things that we've learned about this. And there is going to be no time in our lifetime, I hope, that provides us the same opportunity as we're getting from this um, from this pandemic. Um, not to say that it's a good thing. It is not. There are people really suffering and lives lost, and uh, and obviously our whole world has been turned upside down. But it has focused the importance of internet, um, really reliable, fast internet. On you know, it's focused the attention on that, and there's going to be money coming in. And we should take advantage and, and get this job done for Vermont so that we have uh, the future that we're looking for. So thank you again for having us. This is great. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Paul. Thank you all for joining us. This is the first conversation of many we will continue to have about broadband and how we're going to get this done in Vermont. Um, have a wonderful night. Please stay in touch. Please stay connected. And we look forward to hearing from you again soon. Have a good night. Thank you. Good night, all.